Hey, badass business owners, today we're going to take a deeper dive into a profit and loss income statement. I'm going to be doing a series on profit and loss reviews. And what we're going to do is dive in deeper than just learning how to read it. As you know, I've always preached sales minus cost of goods minus expenses equals your profits. And I tell you to memorize that one calculation because it not only gears how you're going to be pricing, but it also is the flow of a profit and loss statement. But it's one thing to be able to know those are the different columns on your profit and loss. What we want to do is we want to teach you how to dive in deeper and fully understand what your profit and loss is telling you. We're going to take a look at this particular one of an actual business. Now, there's different ways that you can use the information on a profit and loss. In today's example, we're going to be looking at one year versus another year. So in this particular case, we're going to title it this year versus last year. Now, since we are dealing with a full year, we're looking at complete years versus complete years. In this case, we're comparing a 2021 to the year prior of a 2020. And we're going to see what happened in this business and what we can get from the profit and loss and how it lines up with what the business owner was doing. Once again, it's one thing to have the numbers. It's another to understand the why behind the numbers. Now, before we dive in, let me make this a little bit bigger here because what I want to do is go give a quick overview, really quick of the different sections of a profit and loss, and then we will dive in into the numbers. The first section, remember sales minus cost of goods minus expenses equals profits. So our first section on the P&L is going to be the income section. Then we're going to have the cost of goods section. Then we're going to have the expense section. Finally, we're going to end up with the profit section. It happens to be called net operating income. Now you might've noticed there is a fifth line on here called gross profit. The gross profit is just your sales minus your cost of goods. Your gross profit is basically letting you know as a business, what do you have left over to pay the rest of your bills as well as the profitability of the business? Once again, when we dive into the actual PNL, we'll take a closer look at what that is. But just remember, sales minus cost of goods minus expenses equals profits. I teach this to you not only for your PNL, but also for your pricing, because if your pricing lines up with the flow of your profit and loss, believe it or not, you're going to hit your target numbers. And that's why I say that all the time. So if you're ready, let's take a deeper dive in. I'm going to switch over here to an Excel sheet because it's going to be easier for us to track the numbers. So let's start first up. Everything starts with sales. You have no business without sales. You have no profit without sales. You need sales. So that's why we call it the top line. When you hear people talk about the top line, they're talking about sales. Sales, it'll either say sales, it'll say income, it'll say revenue. All three mean the same thing. It's just money coming in to the business. For most of you, you're only going to have one line when you look at your PNL, and that is because you have chosen not to break up your sales into categories. I'm a huge fan of breaking it up into two or three categories, because if you have a business that focuses on two or three key areas, it's a great way to understand how that piece of the business is impacting your top line. Now, in this particular business, they break theirs into residential versus commercial sales. And you're going to notice that this year combined, they did 383. So residential did 301, commercial did 81. Comparing it to the year before, they did 229 total. So that's a huge jump if you think about it from 229 to 383. Last year, their residential was 192 and their commercial sales were 37 thousand. Now you're going to notice there's these percentages. Everything is a percent to sale. If every dollar in is $1 is 100%, how much of it comes from different pieces? That's why you're going to see this broken down. The 78 plus the 21 equals the hundred percent. Now what's interesting is the year prior, their residential sales accounted for 83% of their business. However, this year it was only for 78%. So it actually went down. So even though their sales went up, their residential percentage went down. Now that could be a good thing or that could be a bad thing. In this particular case, this business owner decided to focus on their commercial sales and getting that up. So they went from 37 to 81. They did a great job of driving and building their commercial sales. It went from 16% to 21%. But one has to wonder, did they sacrifice anything at all by not focusing on the residential and moving to their commercial? That's not always a bad thing. If they make more money off of their commercial stuff, 
and they can do more sales. So at the end of the day, their profitability is much higher on commercial, then this might be a trend they want to see. They want to see the percentage coming up on commercial sales and going down on residential. But if it's the other way around and they actually make more money on their residential sales, then they have to be very cautious here that they grow at the same time or they focus on residential versus the commercial. Everybody's going to be a little bit different. But when we're comparing this year to last year, both categories did really well. Both increased. Once again, they did 229 the year prior. This year they did 383. Now you'll notice I have another column here on the end that I have added, which is why we came over here, is because I wanted to know the difference. So the residential grew by $109,000. Their commercial grew by 44,000. Their total sales grew by $153,000. That is a 40% jump in sales. Now we're gonna keep this number in mind because it's gonna come in handy later on. Now I will tell you for most of your profit and loss, you're not gonna have the percentages on there. Sometimes your accountant can go ahead and get those added on there. It depends upon the software system that they're using, including the one that you're doing. I tend to manually do them, but because I don't manually put them on a piece of paper, which is one way to do it, I actually will put move, convert things into a spreadsheet and add those myself, which is why you see that. Remember, 40% up, so good start so far. Everything's looking really good. Now, the very next thing, sales minus cost of goods, right? So let's take a look at our cost of goods and let's see what that is telling us. When we're looking at our cost of goods, we have three main things that drive your cost of goods. One is going to be your materials, your ingredients, and any labor that is needed in order to be able to provide that service or create that product. Labor is a tricky one because you have operational labor and you have labor that is used in the actual doing or creating of the product or service. In this particular business, you're gonna see both. This way you can get an idea of what I'm talking about. Under their particular cost of goods, they have job supplies, that they needed to be able to do the jobs. They have shipping materials because anything they have to ship out to go to the customer. So keep in mind if it's a cost of goods is if they end up getting that material. So a lot of times businesses that uh, box things up for you or send you stuff, they're going to have theirs under a cost of goods because they cannot get you that product, they cannot get you that service, whatever the case may be without that material. So therefore it is a cost of goods. Some people will argue that it's an operational expense. To me, if it ends up with the customer and there's no way you can provide that product or service without those materials, then it should be a cost of goods because you cannot get it to them. And that's the best rule of thumb is if you cannot get them the product, you cannot create the product or you cannot provide the service without it, it typically is going to be a cost of goods. Um, that's a simplized way of saying it. If we look at our job supplies, they went from 16 to 31, 7.3% to 8.3. So not too bad. You would expect it to go up because of the jump in sales. Shipping materials went from 8 to 18, uh, 3.8 3 to 4.9. It's, it's a jump, but at the same time, it's not too off because what's really standing out is right here under labor. The year prior, they had $44,000 in labor hours, which was 19% of their sales. Now, this year, that has jumped to 124, almost $125,000, which is now at 32%. Now, there's two things that are causing this. Part of what you're doing when you're looking at a profit and loss is to understand the why. Sometimes you're going to know the why, and other times you're not going to know the why. What I do when I look at someone's profit and loss is I don't have all the inside scoop on that particular business in the initial phase. So I have to try to start making assumptions about what's going on in the business and then I verify with the business owner. So when I first saw this, it was pretty much what I thought it was and I'm gonna explain that to you in a minute. Because one thing I forgot, everything is a percent of sales. So if sales are 100%, every single one of these percentage is just basically the number divided by the total sales. Because you're going to take your dollar and you're going to give it out to different parts. You're going to put certain pennies. So in this case, eight pennies go over here to job supplies, five pennies go to shipping materials, and 32 pennies go to labor. In case you're wondering how those percentages work. All right. So now labor, what's going on here in the labor? Two big things are going on with the labor. The business obviously grew in sales tremendously. So it's safe to say that they hired some employees to be able to help grow the business. That is a huge chunk of what this $80,000 over here 
went to. However, there was a second thing that happened. I tell you all the time, as a business owner, you're paid under two hats. You have the employee hat that you wear and you have the business owner hat. When you work physically in the business and you either provide the service or create the product, you have to make sure that you're setting aside a fair wage for the money that you are earning while you're wearing that hat. And the reason that you need to do that is it helps ensure that you are pricing correctly to cover the labor that is being done. So this way, as you replace yourself in the business, it is a smooth transition when it comes to your profitability in the business. The business owner you is getting paid if the business is profitable. And we will go over that when we get to the bottom. So in this particular case, the owner of this business did two things. They started paying themselves a fair wage in the business, which is why it jumped, but they also hired a couple of employees that also caused that jump. And we'll take a closer look at that here shortly. But just know that when we're looking at why did the cost of goods go up so much, that is exactly why. Their labor went up because they had to hire people and the owner finally started including his wages in that number as well. Now, when we look at the total cost of goods, this year is 175, last year was 64, and you're gonna see that it grew by 63%. Now, if our sales grew by 40% and our cost of goods grew by 63%, you can tell that we're going to have a problem more than likely by the time we get to the bottom because we're spending more money this year than we did last year. And in this particular case, before we even look at anything else, we know that our labor alone is causing this big jump. Now, if gross profit is the difference between your sales minus your cost of goods, you're going to see that this year is 208 and last year was 165. So 71.9% has dropped down to 54%. But remember, part of that is misleading because last year, whether it's cost of goods or gross profit, the labor hours for the owner were not included. So more than likely, had it been included, this number here of the 165 would have been lower so their gross profit grew by 20%. So the sales grew by 40%, but the gross profit only grew by 20%. Once again, a warning sign that we're gonna have a problem by the time we get down to the bottom. Now our next section has to do with expenses. Your expenses, sometimes called your operational expenses, is every other expense the business has before you get to your profit. Now, most of you are going to recognize these categories because they're very similar because they follow typically what the IRS does, but you can create whatever categories you want. If there is something you want to track in your business, put it in there. If you think that you spend a lot of money in certain sections, you can do that. You can break things down. Advertising, you could have that broken down into different categories. If you have three main ways that you advertise, absolutely. You can put subcategories under anything if you want to track it. Just don't ever feel like you're boxed in because of the way that it does it. These numbers are for you. All you're doing is making sure you capture everything, whether you round them up or you don't round them up. Now, when we're looking at numbers, we'll just kind of pick out a couple on the way down. Last year, they spent $2,900 on advertising. Here's what's funny. They spent less on advertising this year, and yet their sales went up like crazy. Uh, part of that had to do with the fact that they were doing some advertising back here, that because their business grew so much from word of mouth, they really didn't have to advertise. So he did very limited advertising because if he advertised, he would have been in a world of hurt because he already had so much business. So he was able to save some money by not spending the money on advertising. Uh, bank fees, basically you're going to see another area where they didn't have any last year and now they do. Uh, they just switched the way that they were categorizing their bank fees. Their truck went up, uh, their car expenses, because they were actually doing more business this year. 0.8 to 1.1, you'll see percentage wise, it really isn't that big of a difference. Yes, the 2,500 sucks, but you would expect some of that as long as your percentages are in line and there's nothing super crazy out there, that's not a bad thing. Once again, we're trying to figure out where their money went. We're just seeing smaller dollars. Uh, depreciation expense, this is something that's done on the back end. Last year it was 11.5, this year it was 3,000. Basically, the year before, they had a big write-off on something, where this year they do not. So it actually kind of added to the profitability over here. Uh, it looks weird because 
a positive number is actually spending more money and a negative number means you're spending less money, which means you're putting more to the bottom line. It's, it's, it's a backwards kind of thinking here. Uh, let's see, as we go down, equipment went up. Part of that is uh, they had to get some extra equipment for the business, which I'm going to explain here in a minute. One of the big things that this business owner did, which is going to cause some of these lines to go up. Their insurance went from 6,400 up to 12,000. That's a huge jump. Now, the reason that their insurance jumped was twofold. The first thing is going to be employees. They added more employees. When you add more employees, your insurance goes up. But they also made another big change in their business, which also caused their insurance to go up because they had to add more insurance to the business. I'll show you that one in a minute. But once again, we would flag this and want to know why it went up. Uh, legal services, they had uh, settling something over here, which is what caused that to go up. It should be a one-time thing that they got stuck with. Now you'll notice here, office supplies and business expenses. We'll just tie those two in. Uh, we've got about, what, $6,000 right here compared to only $1,000 last year. This was a big jump, $6,000 between the two of them. I know where some of that came from, and I'll explain that here in a minute. But once again, if you saw this normally, you'd go, wow, what are we spending money on? Did we really need that office furniture? Did we need those office supplies? What are we spending money on? We need to ask that question. Uh, remember earlier, the bank fees were uh, zero this year, high last year. Here's where you're going to see it. QuickBooks, they made a switch. Uh, uh, payroll, $1,500 or $15,000 over here and nothing over here. Yep. They added another employee into the business to be the operations. They added an operational person who does not provide the product or service, but what they do is they answer the phone, they do the schedules, they do stuff like that. So in this case, they're payroll for the office is actually going to be down here as an expense because this person does not make the product or deliver the service. Therefore, they are an operational expense. So this is another expense that went up. So their payroll actually went up. Not only what you saw up above, it also went up this $15,000 as well. And you'll see it all came down here to your payroll expenses because they were 1600 jumped to 4000 So payroll was a huge chunk of money that went out for this business last year. And this next line is going to show you the other big one. You'll notice here that their rent was $10,000 this year, 24. They had the opportunity to get into a, another building that was much, much bigger, and it was basically double the price. Now that paid off for them. On one hand, they spent $1,300 more in rent, but it paid off because they were able to expand the business and get ahead of more of their orders. Between labor and this office space, those were two huge things that they did, which is one of the reasons why you saw that bump in insurance, because they also had to do different insurance for the new location. Repairs and maintenance, they're able to keep that kind of low. Well, usually this is high on a lot of people. Uh, safety went up. We had some COVID stuff, obviously, that was in there. Uh, travel went down. It's also COVID related. They didn't travel as much. Utilities went from 428 up to 2400. Uh, I want to point this one out for a couple things. One, we can tell that the utilities went up because they went into a different location and they were running an operation that was much longer through the course of the day. But a mistake a lot of people make is they go, oh, my rent's only going to go up 500 bucks. My rent's only going to go up $1,000. Keep in mind, there are other lines on here that go up because you change locations. In this particular case, I can tell you that their utilities went up because of the new location. And remember back here, the office supplies uh, and other business expenses also went up $5,000. So really they went up $5,000 because they had to buy new equipment and office furniture and everything else to take care of the new building and the new location. So you got your 5,000 there, you got 2,000 here. It all adds up to where they probably spent about, I'd say anywhere between um, $20,000, $25,000 on the new building, which they did not spend the year prior. Uh, so keep that in mind. And I know I've done some coaching with some folks who want to expand their building. It's really important that you look at all of those expenses. So overall, their expenses were 87000 last year compared to the year before, which was 45000 So 19.6 to 22.9. Still not super bad. You, if you can keep that at 20, some people at 25, but if you can keep it at that number, not too bad. But you'll see their overall expenses went up 48 percent. So remember sales went up 40 percent. Their uh, total expenses went up 48 percent. So definitely not good. But we also know that the building was 13,000 of that, that other employee right over here, this 15,000 for the employee, 13,000 for the building. Uh, so right there alone, you've got almost 30,000 of it was this um, 
almost 30,000 of this 42 was because of those two decisions. Everything else was kind of nickel and diming when offsetting the other kind of a situation. Now, how did this impact the bottom line? Sales minus cost of goods minus expenses equals your profit. Let's compare and take a look at the operating income, which is the profit. Now, I'm going to show you some secret stuff down here behind this blue line here in a minute. So overall, last year, or this year, this past year, they had a profitability of $120,000. And the year prior, they also had a profitability of $120,000. So at the end of the day, they basically increased by 14%. They made $168 more than they did the year prior. A couple things on that. One, first off, I know, I wish I could make $120,000 of profit. I totally feel you, and we're gonna get you there. This is, let's take a look at what happened. Remember, they increased their sales by $153,000. They did $153,000 more in sales, but yet only made $168 more. And here's a big chunk of it. The year before, their profitability showed 52%. This year, it was 31%. And by the way, if you can get a 30, 35% profitability, that's a really good business. But what happened is, remember, that 153 was invested back into the business because they hired some employees, they changed locations. So they basically kept taking the money that they were making and reinvesting it back into the business. So instead of the owner taking the money or doing anything, they just kept putting it back into the business to try to grow the business. And this year, if they grow the business more, they shouldn't have to really hire anyone else. They shouldn't have to change locations. They shouldn't have to add more office staff. They should be able to start seeing the rewards of this calculated decision that this business owner made. Now, is the PL perfect? No, there's some wasted money in there, but the PL is telling us a story of this particular business. Now, the other thing that I want to point out is this 120 right here under the year prior is kind of misleading because if you recall, the owner was paying themselves out of the profits, not out of the labor wages. So I'm gonna show you in a minute how this number really wasn't 120 and this business probably made a little bit more money than what it's given itself credit for. Now, the first thing I wanna do since we're on income is let's take a look at what's behind our hidden door here. First off, the first thing we wanna do is $120,000, right? Well, your profit does not go into your pocket as the business owner. I wanna point out that your profitability goes to three things. It goes to taxes, it goes to retained earnings, and it goes to owner's draw. So in this particular case, and I don't know what numbers that they used, I'm just making up numbers, they might set aside $50,000 to pay their taxes because they know they're going to have to pay taxes on all of this money. And remember, as a business owner, if you're, you have to pay taxes on the money you took out of the business as an employee and as a business owner. Now, unless you're on payroll and it pulls out your taxes, you need to make sure that you prepare for that. In this particular case, they're gonna put $50,000 aside. They're gonna leave some in retained earnings, meaning he's gonna keep in the bank and the $40,000 so that he can continue to grow the business. Uh, he has some other money in the business, but he's gonna to add to it $40,000 of this profit. And he's gonna take an owner's draw of $30,000. So whatever money he paid himself as an employee in the business, he's taking out an additional $30,000 as a business owner. Does it have to be this amount? No, he can pick any number he wants up to all 120,000. If he takes all 120, he's gonna be really in trouble when it comes to his taxes. Uh, but he may say, hey, you know what? I got plenty of money in the bank. I don't need to leave $40,000 in retained earnings. And he might decide to take $70,000. Uh, that's up to you as the business owner. I just tell people, make sure that you put something into all three buckets to make sure that you are taken care of. Now, I wanna look at this other piece that I have under here, and that has to do with the owner's wages. Now, the owner is, let's say, working 40 hours a week, and I'm just doing a hypothetical here, and they're gonna pay themselves a fair wage of $20 an hour, and they, the business is open 50 weeks out of the year, which means the owner is actually taking, as an employee, $40,000. Now, if that owner takes $40,000 out, remember they were not doing it under the year prior, which means the 120,000, if they were doing it correctly, the reality is they didn't make $120,000 in profit. They really made this $80,000 right here. 
So if we compare, let's just say we make apples to apples and we say that the owner was being paid up in the labor costs originally, what does that profitability look like? Well, this year doesn't change because he did it the right way, which puts it at 31.4. Since we know this 80,000 is really the right number if they paid themselves correctly up at the top, that puts their percentage now at 34.9% versus the 52. And you're gonna notice this is much more in line, 34% versus 31%. And instead of doing $168,000 in profit, they really had an increase of $40,000, which means their profitability went up 33%. So while the initial line looked like they did not make any money off of that $153,000 that they made in extra sales, they really made an extra $40,000 when you put the numbers to match themselves and line them up. And if we come back up to the top here, we're gonna see here the 153, 40% increase in sales, and once again, 33% down here in profitability. I know I went over a lot of different things in this particular profit and loss, and you may have to watch it a couple of times, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a couple other ones going forward, and we'll continue to break them down just to take a look at what their profit and loss is telling them. And if you like these, make sure that you make a comment below and hit subscribe so you can never miss any. And if you wanna volunteer yours to be looked at, just let me know, and we can do that as well. But hopefully you found this to be very helpful uh, as you go through and you've learned quite a bit about what to look for in a profit and loss statement. With that, I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.